It, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce to you our, our first speaker of the semester, uh, Dr. Scott A. Scott Loveless. Uh, Dr. Loveless is the executive director of the World Family Policy Center, which I'm an associate, and I've had uh, the, the great fortune to get to know him and to work, uh, work with him and work for him uh, for the past several years. Uh, let me just tell you a few brief uh, highlights from his vita, and, and I think it will become very apparent why he is expressly uh, qualified and, and uh, will be particularly interesting on this topic and, and also in, in keeping in mind with, with what, what's going on today in the world. Um, Scott Loveless is, uh, let's begin, <laughs> Uh, he has his Bachelor of Arts in German from Brigham University, graduated in, with honors, with distinction. He also has his Juris Doctorate from the J. Reuben Clark School of Law, and third year as a visiting student at the Georgetown University Law Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the year 2000, he went on to earn his doctorate in family studies at Brigham Young University uh, with his dissertation entitled Paired Conceptions of Morality and Happiness as Factors in Marital Happiness. Before he finished his doctorate, however, he had a, he's had a, a very interesting career uh, in, in practicing the law, and particularly public law. Uh, he was a staff attorney with the Branch of Lands Division of Energy and Resources in Washington, D.C. He was a staff attorney with the same organization and also assistant solicitor with the Dep U.S. Department of the Interior in Washington, D.C. from 1987 to 1990. From 1991 to January of 2001, he was an attorney with the Office of the Field Solicitor, Salt Lake City Field Office, U.S. Department of the Interior. And uh, somewhere in that time, uh, between 2000 and 2001, he had completed his doctorate in family studies and uh, was looking for some way to combine his legal expertise with his uh, interest in research in family issues. Um, in January of 2001, he was hired as the executive director of the World Family Policy Center, uh, which works very closely with the Kennedy Center, the School of Family Life, the School of Social Work uh, across campus on international family policy issues. And as such, he has directed uh, the annual World Family Policy Forum, where uh, more than 50 uh, UN diplomats have come to campus uh, to learn and to teach about international family policy issues. Uh, he's been responsible for outreach and uh, uh, policy uh, setting strategic objectives with the center. Uh, he's attended the UN Conference on Children and uh, actually has a lot more to do than, than we have time to talk about uh, working with the United Nations, member states, NGOs on uh, vital issues of international family policy. Um, perhaps his, his most uh, salient qualification is he is uh, married and ha is the father of eight children. Um, his wife, Sh 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 Sherry, is, Sherry, is not able to be with us today. Uh, she is able to be with us today. Okay, wonderful. Um, welcome. Come out to the front. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn the time over to Dr. A. Scott Loveless, who will be speaking on the macro effects of micro-morality, legal law, moral law, and the rights-based approach. Dr. Loveless. Uh, thank you, Corey. I, um, you know, you live your life and you look back and suddenly somebody stands up and starts reciting it. And you say, that does sound impressive, but, you know, when you're going through it, it's just like going through school and uh, there's not a lot to, uh, and pretty soon you'll have, you'll all have curriculums like that. I mean, it's just, it's a matter of just living life and, and continue trying to learn. I am mindful today of the uh, significance of the date. A year ago, we all suffered a uh, blow, and it's still close to heart for a lot of us. Uh, for me, particularly, I don't know why. Um, and I think it's particularly timely that I can address this topic today, because if we think about what America stands for, uh, we talk about the freedoms we enjoy. We talk about a lot of things, but I want to put, I hope that my lecture today will in some way bring this into a little bit more focus. Uh, just what it is we have as in the way of blessings in this country in contrast to a lot of other places, most other places, if not all other places around the world. 
Um, we live in a world that is still heavily influenced from the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and its emphasis on the rational ability of man, the mind. Uh, and yet I'm reminded of a quote from Theodore Dostoevsky in The Brothers Karamazov where he said, if everything on earth were rational, nothing would happen. I'm also mindful of a quote from uh, Sir Thomas More in the, the play A Man for All Seasons. The law, Roper, the law. I know what's legal, not what's right. And I'll stick to what's legal. I'm not God. The currents and eddies of right and wrong, which you find such plain sailing, I can't navigate. I'm no voyager. But in the thickets of the law, oh, there I'm a forester. And what would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get after the devil. And when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper? The laws all being flat. This country's planted thick with laws from coast to coast. Man's laws, not God's. And if you cut them down, do you think you could really stand upright in the winds that would blow them? Yes, I'd give the devil the benefit of law for my own safety's sake. I mentioned these two quotes just as a kind of an introduction to the general topic I want to be addressing today. There is the relationship between law, my topic is the relationship between law and morality. And I'm going to be using quite a bit of time to set the stage because this is a very complicated play. It's the play of life. So if you'll pardon me, I want to come back to that topic. I want you to know where I'm going in advance because it may not be apparent partway through. A few years ago, um, there began an effort by some people at the United Nations to advance a system of conventions and treaties, advancing what is known uh, kind of behind the scenes is the right based appro- rights-based approach. The rights-based approach to law. And I'll, as I said, I'll come back to this, but I want you, I need to set a stage before I can talk about it. Um, the rights-based approach is problematic for a number of reasons, but they're not apparent. And one of the things that its advocates like to Uh, take advantage of is the fact that they can use language, ambiguous language or uh, high sounding language, noble sounding language to advance some causes that are quite invidious in a lot of ways. Several years ago I read a newspaper account of a story uh, a woman, a family in Florida, a Hispanic family was taking a walk along a golf course with their children. And out of nowhere, well, at least they didn't see it coming, an alligator lunged from the tall grass, grabbed their five-year-old son, and began dragging him into the water. Without thinking, the mother leaped onto the alligator, pried his mouth open, released her son, And together, she and her son struggled back to dry ground. He was hurt, but he was not, but he was safe. The alligator was not accustomed to such treatment and fled into the swamp. Her act was brave, inspirational in a lot of ways, but let's think about why. The American alligator is cousin, of course, to the African crocodile somewhat larger than most South American caiman species. It can break a person's leg with one swipe of its tail. Its jaws and teeth can kill in a matter of seconds. This mother risked her life to save her son. Why did she do it? Now, to come back to my main topic, I want you to understand, think about this. Is there any law written that she would have broken 
Has she not done what she did? No, of course not. And yet, she probably didn't consider her act to be much of a choice. She didn't see any real option, I guess. Her action was a result not of legal law and and adhering to the rules. It was an action based on moral law. The need to respond, the, the, the call to respond to the need of another person, particularly a family member. I'll be referring to two, these two kinds of law. Not, I don't want to confuse the issue by calling it legal law because that kind of redund- sounds redundant. So I'll call it codified law and moral law. And I want to talk about the relationship between them and, and then bring it to bear in what's ha- some of the things that are happening at the United Nations right now. No matter where we live and what kind of codified laws exist in our cultures, we choose a level of morality to live. In my doctoral dissertation, I examined the what I call three broad categories of, um, of morality. I don't know if I can use this high-tech equipment, Corey, but I'll try. Um, I'll put this in gospel terms as well. In Alma chapter 44, Alma refers to God's plan of happiness. Um, It should go without saying that there are competing theories, however. Um, Hedonism is probably commonly understood in uh, Western culture. We think of the statement of Jeremy Bentham. Pleasure and pain are our sovereign masters. That's a hedonistic uh, statement of philosophy. The most salient, uh, succinct statement of hedonism's philosophy was by the ancient Greek, that I'm aware of at least, was by the ancient Greek Aristippus. He said, one should strive for nothing else but to experience as many pleasures as possible and as intensely as possible. For pleasures differ neither in degree nor in quality. No considerations should restrain one in the pursuit of pleasure, for everything other than pleasure is unimportant, and virtue is the least important of all. Just to put it in context, a person with a hedonistic mindset would probably never have even thought to jump on the alligator and release the boy. would have been screaming and running the other way to avoid personal threat. There is a in the moral philosophy literature, you'll find a, an argument between two theories of happiness. One is called hedonism, and the other is typically called, referred to another broad topic of eudaimonia, what Aristotle called eudaimonia. I changed the name just for convenience to call it individualism. Um, individualism is the theory that says happiness comes not from just pure pleasure, but from distinguishing between good kinds of pleasure and bad kinds of pleasure. Where the hedonist will go for any short-term pleasure, avoidance of pain, the hedonist is is willing to sacrifice in the short term in order to achieve in the long term uh, honors, benefits, Things are considered honorable in in the world around us. Uh, This often requires hard work and sacrifice. It involves things such as academic learning, uh, skill and talent development, athletic prowess, civil service, other achievements. An individualist would tend to live by the rules, not to cause any immediate harm to other people. Aristotle thought this was the way to find happiness, to find the noble life. And and it distinguishes itself explicitly from hedonism. Aristotle himself said that, you know, if 
in referring to a hedonistic life lived for the appetites of, of food and sex. He said that a person who pursued those appetites might as well have been a, born a beast because a lot of animals have just as much of those as any person who strives for those things. Um, again, for context, in the case of an alligator attack, the individualist might be expected to be very concerned, scream for help, be very anxious about the situation, try to figure out what to do rationally, all from a relatively safe distance. But altruism differs fundamentally from both. That's the third category. Differs from hedonism and individualism. Where those personal moralities differ from each other by the types of self-interest they seek, altruism does not seek self-interest at all. It seeks the, the interest of the neighbor as well as the self, as part of the self, as thyself, in scriptural terms. Um, hedonism for all of its short-term benefits as, a, as they might be thought of, inevitably leads to conflict between people. Because if my desires conflict with your desires, and we can't both have what we want, then there's an argument. So the hedonist is willing to sacrifice the relationship with the person in order to attain, attain the pleasure. Um, and one of my favorite little cartoons, Calvin and Hobbes, for those of you who may or may not remember it, was one of the great cartoons, and, and Bill Watterson that wrote it, understood a lot of this. We don't have enough uh, resolution, but what he says is... Uh, Memorize the pictures, then I'll read it to you. Calvin in the, in the wagon says, It's true in Hobbes, ignorance is bliss. Once you, start, uh, once you know things, you start seeing problems everywhere. And once you see problems, you feel like you ought to try to fix them. And fixing problems always seems to require personal change. And change means doing things that aren't fun. I say fooey to that. But if you're willfully stupid, you don't know any better. So you can keep doing whatever you like. The secret to happiness is short-term, stupid self-interest. Hobbes says, we're headed for that cliff. Calvin covers his eyes and says, I don't, want to, I don't want to know about it. And they go off the cliff and land. And Hobbes says, I'm not sure I can stand so much bliss. And Calvin says, careful, we don't want to learn anything from this. Okay. Um, in the 18th, 19th century, there was an American lawyer by the name of uh, Lewis Henry Morgan who was representing the Seneca Iroquois tribe in upstate New York in a, in a dispute against the Ogden Land Company. In the course of his work, he noticed that the Seneca had a system for designating kin that differed from the system that he was familiar with from the Euro-American tradition. He noticed that anyone who was a relative was called father or mother. And they didn't distinguish between uncles and aunts and mo mothers and fathers the way we do. They had the same word for both. It piqued his interest. And over the next several years, he began a study of cultures around the world. Was eventually published in the by the uh, Smithsonian in, uh, Museum in Washington, D.C., is uh, Systems of Consanguinity and Affinity to the Human Family. And it showed that most cultures of the world followed the same system as the Seneca. Fascinating. Since his, since his publication, his work has spawned a lot of varying explanations and used to support a lot of divergent theories, including even Engels and his theory of communism. Um, but, it, but one of the consistent findings that has come out of the scholarship that's followed Morgan's work is the idea that kin, there's a kinship morality is different from the morality in the larger culture. In other words, there's a predisposition in families to care for one another as opposed to the arm's length kind of transactions that typically occur in the business world or in the world of strangers. 
uh, Engels even unwittingly, I think, perhaps noticed some of this, and he quotes a, a study by Mr. Sternberg, who said that among the Sakhalin, the Sakhalin Island off the coast of Siberia, they had found a, a tribe of, of uh, Aborigines called the Kiliaki. He said, among the Sakhalin Kiliaki, one rarely meets with crime due to selfish motives. Gilead keeps his valuables in a shed which is never locked. Murder among the Gilead is very rare and in most cases is committed in fits of anger. At all events, it is never committed for selfish motives. In his relations with others, the Gilead displays truthfulness, loyalty to his word, and conscientiousness. He went on to say that the members of the clan in the Gilead complied with, quote, the necessity of having constantly to act in the interests of his fellow. Again, this is a society where there is no civilization in the, in the normal sense, but where family is dominant. Another indication that in families there's a different kind of predisposition, or at least an inclination, to care for one another. We should be familiar with that from our own families. Um, Dorothy Lee is a, was an anthropologist who taught at Michigan State for a long time. And she studied a number of, of Indian cultures and uh, Polynesian cultures where the same phenomenon occurred. She cited a, in some of her work Margaret Mead's study of the Arapesh tribe of New Guinea who grew food only to give it to others and themselves only ate what they were given by others. They considered the lowest form of humanity to be the man who ate his own kill, even one tiny bird. And commenting on this conception of, the, she calls it the open self, in contrast to the Western idea of the closed self. And she talks about the amazing difference it makes just to have a, this different preconceived idea of what a person is. If we look at ourselves as an in singular insular entity that only voluntarily engages in relationships. We're missing out on the very fact that we are inseparably and inexorably tied to other people. We exist in relationships. And the open self that she describes not only acknowledges but values this relationship, this kind of uh, uh, view of the self. One is part of others, quite literally, and you cannot, there's no action that is purely private because you are not only, you are all times part of the larger community. And if, if you do something that's detrimental to the community at large, you're hurting yourself as well as the community. The idea of private morality or private victimless crime would not exist in such a culture. Well, again, this has been stage setting, but I want to talk about the relationship. Oh, um, one more cartoon, and I don't know if it'll be any better than the last one, but it might be. Again, Calvin and Hobbes. I think it's time we had a new dad around here. This illustrates the, the effect of the distinction between legal law and moral kinship law. I think it's time we had a new dad around here. When does your term of office expire? Sorry, Calvin, I was appointed dad for life. For life? What about a recall vote? What about impeachment? There are no provisions for either. Did you write this constitution yourself or what? Well, your mom helped some too. <laughs> if humor is simply an illustration of a deviation from the norm, we, the fact that we laugh at such humor means that we recognize instinctively that there is something true about what he's saying. The distinction that Calvin wants, the, the erasing the distinction that Calvin wants to do is wrong. And just to give you a little foreshadowing, this is what's happening at the United Nations. In a lot of cases, a lot of people trying to advance the, the rights-based approach would have the effect of erasing the distinction between legal law and family or moral law, altruistic law. The relationship between moral law and legal law, I, I've tried to capture it in this overhead.
legal law is this black jagged line across the bottom. The vertical line, mostly vertical, um, represents a moral spectrum. So if hedonism is at the bottom, and you have individualism in the middle and altruism at the top, with altruism yielding unity between people, individualism yielding stability, if not peace, and a form of peace by compromise. And hedonism, of course, results in conflict. What legal law does, codified law, is draw a line across the spectrum. And it says, below this line, we will not allow your personal morality to fall without punishment. So the murderers, the rapists, the arsonists, the thieves, and so on, their desires outweigh any sense of responsibility either to rules or other people. In the law, we also have the law of torts, um, personal duty and responsibility between people. Um, criminal law is, is codified by the public as far as what kind of actions are, are published inherently or punished inherently. Tort law is the law that we think of as civil law that can be enforced in courts if you want to sue somebody for violating your uh, human dignity or they're, they're violating their obligations to you as a human being. Um, so law, codified law as we think of it today, with the kind that's taught across the street at the law school, establishes a public norm, if you will, a public level of acceptable morality. As long as you're on the right side of that line, the law doesn't worry about you. It doesn't encourage you to get any better. It doesn't encourage you to choose one action or another as long as it's on the right side of that line. If you fall below it and you're caught, you're punished. But if you're not caught, you're never punished. Contrast that with moral law. What I've described is the inevitable result of hedonism, of conflict, open conflict, um, follows inexorably, follows naturally. It's simply because of the true relationships between people. When hedonism is present, conflict eventually comes forward where you have people who live by rules, like the individualists, then that conflict can be stabilized and mediated to some degree, but it does not truly go away. It's just below the surface. If a person can get to the level of altruism and understand and live by that, con by that standard, not only is there no conflict, there is harmony, unity. Um, in the law, we have two categories of crimes one we call malum prohibitum. In Latin, that means bad because it's prohibited. The speeding, the speeding speed limits or the truck weight limits on the highways. Is there anything inherently immoral about being five pounds over the weight limit for your semi? No. But if you're caught and weighed and you're five pounds over, the highway patrol will give you a ticket. So you'll be fine for that violation of, of the law. There's another category of crimes, however, called malum in se, which means it's inherently wrong. Murder, rape, arson, theft, things of this character fall into this category. And there are some people in the world today who have come to believe that all law falls in the first category. That murder is only wrong because it's prohibited, because it's by consensus of the majority. Um, that should strike most of us, I believe, as kind of odd. But there are people who not only believe that, who are working very hard to advance that in, in the international and national standards of law. Um, so that there's a little bit of time to ask questions. I'll skip ahead a little bit. But 
Religion and government, therefore, are mutually dependent on one another. Religion doesn't enforce law the way government does, but it depends on government to establish a minimum level of stability, of civilization, that would not exist without it. In order that it has the freedom to preach and teach people to be better, to encourage people to move up the moral spectrum. Government, in its turn, is dependent on, gov- on religion teaching the people to be better people. Because obviously, the, the higher people are on the spectrum, the fewer problems government has to deal with your criminals there are to worry about, and so on. Uh, You're probably familiar with Hugo's classic story, Les Miserables. Remember how it started? Poor Jean Valjean's problem. What is it? Why did he steal the bread? Because his family was hungry. Okay? His family didn't have anything to eat, and so he went out one night, stole some bread, got caught, Ended up spending years in prison, broke out of prison, and the government was chasing him. Inspector Javert was chasing him for years and years, trying to find this guy who had had the audacity to break the law by breaking out of prison, not to mention stealing the bread. Well, what if Jean Valjean's next door neighbor had caught him coming out of the house on the way to steal the bread and said, What's wrong? Why do you look so distraught? And he said, My family doesn't have anything to eat. And he said, Well, I've got some. Here, let me give you some bread. The whole book wouldn't have existed. (laughs) Hugo would have had nothing to write about. And the government would have had nothing to do in that case because of the personal morality of the people, at least this one person. That's why I refer to this lecture, generally speaking, as the macro effects of micro morality because individual morality does matter. Government works better when the people don't need it as much. There will always be some role for government to play, if nothing else, than to regulate what we do in our business dealings and how fast we should drive on the freeways. But to the degree the people don't need to be governed by law because they're governed by moral law voluntarily, government has a much easier road to hoe, the taxes are lower, Everything's better. At the end of uh, the Hobbit series, when Frodo returns to the Shire, he finds that the bad guys have taken over the government of the Shire. And he says, he notes that the supply of everything except rules has gotten shorter and shorter. You require more rules. You require more legal law to regulate the the inevitable effects of hedonism. So when people talk about personal morality or private decisions or victimless crimes, don't believe it for a minute. Because in a moral perspective, perhaps the harm is remote. Perhaps the harm is not immediate. But it is just as real. And it affects society at large. Let me uh, skip now and get back to the topic of... oh. There's a three-legged stool. I, say, I talk about religion and government being mutually dependent. But both government and religion are dependent on one other entity in society, the family. Aristotle said years ago, many centuries ago, that if the, the first premise is the procreative act between man and woman, then he says you need government. But government is unnecessary if you don't have people. And if the morality of the family and religion is allowed to hold sway, you don't need much government at all. Let me skip back now to where I started. At the United Nations, there is a, a concerted effort being made by some people. And I don't want to make it sound like the United Nations itself is the problem. What it does is serve as a forum for people to get together and talk, countries, 
and NGOs. And there are an awful lot of NGOs in the last 30, 40 years who have come to the idea of what we might think of as political correctness. What is political correctness? The idea that as long as you're legal, it doesn't matter what you do. Now, in in the light of what I've talked about, in fact, it's wrong of you to say that it does matter what we do, what I do. That's not politically correct. So the rights-based approach is the solidification, the 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 uh, what's the the reification? That's the fancy word for it, but it's the embodiment of the the right the uh, the idea of political correctness. The rights-based approach says you have a legal right to do everything as long as it's above the line of the law. And if you say that I don't have a right to do or that it's morally wrong, if it's sinful, can you can be sinful and still be legal, right? Any question about that? What they, what they want to do is twist this and say that the vertical... Spectrum doesn't exist. And as long as you stay on the right side, first of all, they they try to lower the line as far as possible. And then then they say, as long as you're above the line, you have a legal right to do it and nobody can challenge you for it. And if someone says homosexuality is a sin or says that a mother should stay home with her children and might make them feel guilty if the woman chooses not to, then you have violated not only the, the, the law, but the, the human rights of those people who might feel differently. In Canada last year, a Protestant minister was fined 1500 Canadian dollars, which is not a lot of money, but was fined for taking out an ad in a newspaper that said, in effect, homosexuality is a sin. In Great Britain, this, just this past summer, a Protestant minister was standing on a soapbox in a, co- in a public commons area preaching the same basic message. Um, a group of the affected individuals gathered around him and started pelting him with mud. And then they called the police and had him arrested and, and sued him for uh, violating their human rights as homosexuals simply for exercising his free speech to to speak his mind. In Holland last year, a Muslim minister had a radio broadcast with the same basic message. He was jailed for, last I heard it was, he was still in jail after six months. He published a retraction. He'd apologized for offending people, et cetera, et cetera, but he was still in jail and was going to be fined for publicizing that message. What is the effect? Again, it lowers the standard. It says you have a legal right to be above the standard and nobody can challenge you for whatever choice you make. And we believe in freedom in this country. But one of the freedoms we cherish most dearly is our freedom of religion. Our freedom to try to be as good as we can and help others become so as well. Suddenly, the newly defined human rights that are the creature of law, not malum in se, not moral law, are the legal law is trying, they're trying to use legal law to supplant moral law, to say that moral law is not necessary as long as we have legal law correctly enforced. And freedom of religion, and even your freedom to teach your own children what values you hold dearest to your heart, are at risk. Now, that sounds in in the American culture like perhaps a bit of an overstatement. But when you spend very much time in the basement of the United Nations, and you hear the arguments being advanced, and you see the fervor with which they are advanced, it's not at all unrealistic. Uh, I was skeptical going in, but I've seen it too many times myself. 
You need to be prepared, brothers and sisters, for the future. And you need to work very hard to protect your ability to teach your children so that they can teach their children the truths that we know. The rights-based approach. I I wrote this down, so I'm going to say it better. The sincerity of their conviction doesn't change the effect of their agenda on the lives of people. The consequences of natural or moral law are inevitable. No redefinition of good can change the fact that a moral spectrum does exist and that our children and their children will suffer immeasurably if law comes into force without a moral foundation. Law that is not only at odds with natural moral law, but affirmatively repugnant to it, hostile to it. The rights-based approach is political correctness with teeth and jaws and a powerful tail. An alligator, every caring parent in every country should fight with everything they have to keep it from eating their children alive. Governments everywhere should resist the peer pressure of the advocates of the rights-based approach and see it for what it is. A smooth, sly challenge to the authority and influence of good government's best and essential partners, religion and family, lying in the tall grass waiting for its prey. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions for a few minutes. Only a few, I'm sorry. Sir. Um, There's a series of seven treaties and conventions. The CEDAW is one of them that you'll see a lot in the news anymore. The the Convention for the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Again, they they talk about a lot of honorable, good things, but then they sweep a lot of things under the tent with it. Um, We don't believe that women's rights should be violated. They, They should be honored and respected. But what they talk about, for example, is the right of teenage girls to abortion upon demand without the knowledge or consent of their parents. The right to full sexual expression at the age of, in some cases they say 12. Um, the rights of, uh, of what they call it, they, they, advocate, they advance what they call the, uh, they try to mainstream the gender perspective. And, you know, that sounds like you don't know what it means, but what they mean by it is the right to choose your sexual preference at, at, at will without anybody saying anything bad about it. They, undermine, they, they try to fight every time we argue for in, in, including language about the rights of parents to teach their children values. They fight against it. Um, they talk about the right to abortion on demand, sexual expression on demand. They want to redefine family to be any collection of people who decide they want, they want to be a family, get rid of the very idea of the connection between family and, and reproduction, human reproduction. Um, Corey, what are some of the other ones? And they want to legalize prostitution as a legitimate business enterprise. That's one. And they have in, in some countries. Um, go to Holland and see. <laughs> in the back. Um, of course I mean the the the, I I don't want to to have what I next say be taken as a statement in favor of one political party or the other because I think both political parties have their problems but there is a definite trend in the Democratic Party toward ideas that foster the idea of political correctness. It is a hallmark of the Republican Party has becoming, it's, it's been polarized. And it should, you know, a, few year, a few decades ago, it wasn't this way. But today, um, 
the idea of human rights and this new definition of human rights is being advanced by the liberals and resisted by the conservatives. And I think that's kind of the instinctual, um, instinctive sense that a lot of us have about what's going on in American politics today. I, I like to say, in light of altruism, the Democratic Party is comprised of the people who think you can do whatever you want. And the Republican Party is comprised of the people who say you can have whatever you want. And they're both wrong. But on this other level, um, that's the distinction I'm talking about. Um, I think Christ's approach is better than either political approach, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Okay. Please. Well, they go in, in tandem. The, the, the decline of, of morality, I guess what I'm saying, what I'm trying to get you to see here is the, what they're doing is, is not only lowering the standard of morale, public morality, but then enforce and being able to enforce it as a legal right, challenging our ability to say you shouldn't be that way, even if you're legal. Um, I can get on a soapbox and talk for a long time about this, I guess, but I, I, I don't want to be misunderstood. <clears throat> the decline in morality is, is serious, and it has real implications. And we need to fight it at, at every level. I mean, the, the incremental um, erosion of public morality through the court system and through Hollywood You've all, you've all seen it. You go to a Muslim country, and they've got standards there that a lot of Americans chafe under because they don't feel like they're free to do what they want. But it's consistent with a lot of the moral codes of those people. And they don't chafe because the morality and the law, they're in harmony in their minds. Um, if you remember the red and the blue from the most recent presidential election, um, it's the liberal states that were blue and the red states that were conservative. And there was so much riding on that vote in Florida, more than you'll ever understand, because if the United Nations, under Clinton, the United States was on the wrong side of the agenda with the United Nations on these issues. Under Bush, we're holding the line. We have allies there in the United States instead of enemies. And it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing the difference it makes. Again, I, I'm, I don't want to be political here, but that is the reality of the effect of that election at the United Nations, at least, and perhaps elsewhere. I'll leave that to you. Okay? Corey?